My name is Jim Satterfield from Firestorm. We're going to be talking about uh, crisis communications and specifically if you look at the screen that's in front of you, stop. You're saying the wrong thing at the wrong time to the wrong people the wrong way. Gee, that sounds like most Mondays in Atlanta traffic as you're trying to go from point A to point B. This is part of the 2017 Crisis Coach webinar series and we're delighted to have you be a part of our uh, session today. Uh, and if I can get my computer to advance, which it hopefully will here, there we go. We'd also like you to be our friend on social media, uh, on Twitter at, at Firestorm Soul, and on Facebook, Firestorm Solutions. There is a hashtag for this session, and it's hashtag Crisis Coach. You can also, if you've got a question or a comment, type it into the toolbar in the upper right uh, hand side of your screen. and. Uh, as time will allow, we'll try to speak with each one of you individually. Firestorm transforms crisis into value. We empower you to manage risk and crises. Our expertise is in the area of crisis management, critical decision support, crisis communications, crisis public relations, and consequence management. And obviously, the topic of today's session really relates to uh, all five of those items. So if you look at the balance between risk and crisis, that's where a crisis coach can help. Firestorm follows a predict, plan, perform methodology. There is a disclaimer today, as uh, everybody has attorneys and they always want to make sure that we do the right thing. It's not complete without the oral comments and discussion. Any work product that we uh, supply should be in guidance with your local uh, council and regional and local authorities. Moreover, it's uh, not legal opinion or legal advice. Uh, we're speaking today with uh, Dr. Michael Redman, and uh, I don't believe Dr. Michael uh, Redman has joined us yet on the call, but hopefully she'll come on, and when she does, we'll ask her to speak about the uh, Eastern Great Lakes chapter of the uh, Association of Contingency Professionals. They've changed that name from planners to professional. If you are an ACP member, we think that's a, a great opportunity for you. If you're not, it certainly gives you access to a great deal of information and a chance with, to meet with the Eastern Great Lakes uh, chapter there and meet your peers and counterparts to understand uh, what's going on in that area. So it's underwritten by uh, that group, and I think it's a time for us to get started then. My name is Jim Satterfield. I'm the president and CEO of Firestorm. And you saw on the beginning slide where we were talking about you're saying the wrong thing at the wrong time to the wrong people the wrong way. And invariably, when we see a crisis develop, we see those issues starting to happen. And today, we're going to try to frame that a little bit and give you some advice and direction uh, for your crisis management team and your organization as you find yourself in those positions. I also would remind you about five W's. We're going to talk about five Y's a little bit later, but the five W's here, you probably remember when you were in school that and you were writing a paper, the English teacher was saying, well, you should write about what it is and where it is and why and when and who. So those five W's are going to play a role also in crisis communications as we think about it because we have to figure out who we're speaking to and what it is we should be speaking to them about and when we should have those conversations because that's the element that starts to create a problem. We also would like to thank the Greater Rochester Chamber of Commerce for their support in this webinar series. Now, we did a survey earlier this year and as we do on most of the webinars that Firestorm produces, we get information about what everyone is seeing in the market in a variety of areas. And if you look at this particular question, it's very telling. What crisis event would be the number one concern for your organization? You see a, a big response on cyber attack. And every time we uh, turn on the television or we look on the uh, internet or we uh, see the news and as it's coming out, there's another cyber breach. And it's not just five people, it's hundreds of thousands or millions that uh, identity has been placed in and risk. Also associated with that, we see ransomware in those types of events coming in where organizations are parallels, uh, paralyzed by it. We saw a facility in western New York that this occurred to just a few months ago. 
natural disasters certainly get the news. Uh, as we see, we're in hurricane season uh, just now as those storms start to develop or an earthquake and the, the wildfires out west are certainly a big factor. Uh, if I were to ask everybody on the call today, uh, do you feel that workplace violence or violence as a whole is increasing or decreasing? Universally, it's increasing. I'm speaking at a conference this week in Dallas, Texas, and 1,200 people are here and I asked that question and unanimously everyone feels that violence is increasing around us. Uh, significant reputation, uh, if I were to say the name United Airlines, we'd be thinking about that uh, doctor being dragged down the aisle and thrown off the uh, plane. So reputation events certainly can disrupt and change the direction significantly. Terrorist events, uh, we've been inundated with events particularly out of uh, London and Great Britain as we see those areas and it's a matter of time until we see uh, that again here on US soil. Uh, so 9-11 was not a one time and never again event unfortunately and anything with loss of life. Well, I, I think that that's a fairly good list that you uh, put together to share with us and uh, as we looked at it. We asked a second question though that ended up being very startling. While this was very easily understood this became more difficult. Has your organization created a complete all hazards message maps? Do you know what you're going to say? And if you'll look, 14% said, yeah, we've got those in place. 57 said no, and 29 were unsure, which meant no, we don't have it. So of all the risks that you know and you're concerned about, we find that organizations aren't prepared to talk on those subjects. When you're in the pressure of a crisis, it's not the time to craft your messaging. It's not the time to figure out what will we say, what will we not say, who's going to say it, how will those things come out. So planning in advance makes it easier because it's easier to edit than create. That's a significant gap that each of us see within these organizations. As we continue on, here's what we know in the landscape. How much time do you have to respond in a crisis? Cyber breach or violent act? The answer is none. You've got to identify those risks before they come become crises. And as most of you on the phone are working in the area of business continuity or crisis management or resilience and come from that background, we have to identify these threats in advance. We have to be prepared with what are the actions we're going to take, who is the group that's going to make the decisions, and make sure that we're ready in each of those levels. But just as we're ready with the physical actions and the critical decisions, we must all be ready with what are we going to say. In any crisis, it breaks down to three things. The decisions you make, the actions you take, and the words that you say. Those three elements will determine is this crisis going to stabilize or escalate. And as we do, we know that most everything we learn initially in a crisis is wrong. So since we've got unique exposures, we need to have an open source intelligence program to be prepared to tell us when this thing that we're so worried about is starting. When is it beginning to uh, occur in planning in those areas? We're not going to focus today on that intelligence network too much, but we are going to be focusing on the messaging side. And so obviously waiting in these areas isn't an issue. And every one of us probably has been in a position where senior leadership has gotten surprised. And generally, that's not a pleasant experience. So we want to know and be ready before now, before that event occurs. Now, there is a concept called visibility vulnerability. And there are two elements within that, and we'll talk just briefly about them. If you think about someone that's in the middle of a crisis and they're having um, stories written about them, reporters focusing on it, uh, they're getting questions from employees, from clients, customers in a school environment, from students and parents, that puts every word they say under a critical analysis. Their visibility level is significantly higher and it creates a visibility vulnerability for their organization to be able to uh, have every word reviewed de in detail. Now, you, the, another survey question that we had asked around this was, do you measure your visibility in a crisis? About a third of you said yes. 
just under a third said no, and a little over a third said, what are you talking about? This comes back to that intelligence network before and after. There's a second aspect about visibility vulnerability that comes into play. One, because you now are high profile and under uh, duress from what everything is being said, it's your ability to see what's going to happen next. If we were talking in a military environment, there's a phrase called the fog of war. You lose sight because of all the moving, changing parts and all the confusions that would happen. But any general would like to know, where is the enemy? What's the size of their force? What direction are they moving? What weapons do they have? And then, so that ability to see that and understand it will help in what is the battle plan associated with it. Similarly, if your organization is facing a crisis, one of those threats that we talked about at the very beginning, your leadership needs to understand what are people saying about us? What is going to be happening next? Where are we going? And that will come back and play a significant role in our communications area. So we kind of framed it. You know what you're worried about. You don't have the messages about it. And you know that you're going to be more vulnerable. So this open source intelligence tells us that we can find ways to get that information. Uh, as we look in each one of these areas, there's some statistics that work out to our advantage here. If someone has ill intent, I'm upset about something, I'm angry, I'm moving toward an act of violence, I'm taking those types of areas, 80% of the time someone else knows about that person and knows about that. And even more importantly, 67% of the time, two or pe more people know. And when they know, what do they do? They talk. And where do they talk? They talk on social media. That's that social chatter that you see over on the left of the screen. So having a system where you can monitor, where you know what's being said, it also helps if you're doing an evacuation. Your people can report where they are, what's happening. If other things are starting to occur, you get a better sense and level of that battlefield as a general would to know what's starting to occur. So as we go into this, we think there's stages of escalation that you should be aware of. Now, when Firestorm is designing a plan, we talk about pre-action, onset, impact assessment, response and recovery, and finally, the post-recovery. Those aren't the stages we're talking about here. We're talking about here the stages of awareness that we need to be focused on. But every plan we write, is focused on those five stages around responding. What do you do at onset? You're worried about life and safety. What are you doing in impact assessment? How bad is it? Response and recovery, how do we respond? How do we get our organizations back up and running? Now we're into continuity and resiliency types of issues. But let's talk about where we are today. Um, predictive intelligence monitoring, you're looking at a guarded level. Guarded here refers to the fact that Nothing has happened yet. It may happen. There may be something that's occurring out there. But we're just kind of listening to see what's going on. It's Think of it as an early warning system uh, just to see. And it's a background. It's building this base, this level, so that if you see a change, it becomes more apparent and you reduce the surprise element that's occurring. So it's a general one. And that research is done around your vulnerabilities and risks that are unique to your organization. So we design to look for the types of things that you've identified are occurring to let you know that they might be moving forward. Now, if that causes you to become aware of something, and there's a particular threat associated with one of the risks or vulnerabilities that you've done, we'll kind of increase our, our monitoring of it. And so this is a managed threat in intelligence. We're looking at that particular threat. We're, we're focusing in on it to see what else we can learn associated with it. It's at an elevated level because it's moved beyond the background area. It's moving, come, becoming closer to activities. And then if you see this starting to escalate, where this thing is really going to happen, the event that we were concerned about, it's starting to occur, we then it's imminent. And then we've identified that threat monitoring, and we're specifically targeting identifying the impacts on us and the directions we're going. Now, and then the final is when it is a very targeted active threat. Uh, the uh, violent element is there. What are people saying about us? The brand and reputation attack is such. So we can be much more specific in the tools we use and the information that we gather 
at that point in time. Now, as you see from this chart uh, that's coming up across your screen, these work together and there's an escalation of the response and the level of information that you need depending upon each of those stages. So as we think about those four stages and what we would do, we can enter in any point. You may not be monitoring what you needed and it's suddenly the first thing you do, you become aware that this event has occurred. So we're automatically starting at the severe level and trying to respond. We um, have a large commercial account where uh, it was identified uh, on their corporate Facebook that someone was going to go to a particular location and kill everyone. And so the client called and asked, what could we do? And so we started to do research and uh, Karen Mazzullo's team, uh, Karen's our chief information intelligence officer, and she started to look and she was able to identify who the person was, their girlfriend, their home address, and we were able to communicate that back to the client and it turned out to be a 17 year old that had worked in their facility who had been fired and was coming back to even the score. So on a Wednesday afternoon in two hours that was able to be identified before the Friday attack was about to occur. They turned it over to the police who went to the family and talked with the son and the family and I can't imagine it was a warm and fuzzy kind of conversation. In the meantime a geofence was set up around the targeted location and uncovered that the manager in that location was selling drugs out the back door. So in two hours, we were able to find the drug dealer and the person who was going to create violence. Thinking about all the communications around that and the significance of those things, knowing that empowered the organization not to say and do the wrong thing. So when you find yourself in a crisis, uh, there are actions that you will take. and. Uh, it again follows the predict, plan, perform methodology. But if you look at this long list, there's a difference there. You'll see, well, wait a minute, Jeff. Some of those things are in bold and some of them aren't. I bolded every item on the screen that relates to communications. The reason to do that is to emphasize to you that the majority of these actions are communications oriented and not action oriented. Most of your plans, and we have reviewed hundreds of plans annually for organizations, find that they spend a great deal of time um, talking about the incident command structure or the national incident management structure or uh, shutdown, uh, lockout, lockdown, evacuate, shelter in place. And they're focused on these actions, but they're not focused on who's going to say what, to whom, and when. And if you look at this, these types of things will greatly change the out outcomes and the actions that we need to take. So as we move from there, there are some misconceptions around here. And the speakers that are coming up on the screen, you can see each one of them expressing some sentiments. We don't have, if we don't make a statement, they'll think we're guilty. Our CEO wants to call a press conference. She says she can wing it. We have to get out in front of this. Every one of the comments that you see on the screen we have heard and hear in most crisis situations. Unfortunately, every one of those are wrong. And those misconceptions will cause the problem to escalate, not de-escalate. It will cause the control to shift from your organization over to those that are brand attractors or those that have other objectives associated with it. Uh, we don't want you to talk early because what most of everything you know is wrong. And once you make a wrong statement, you're going to have difficulty uh, regaining credibility and maintaining awareness of where you are. The people who feel that they can handle the media generally can't. And there are questions that are asked that will put you in a negative light and creating that type of an environment. If I were to ask you today, do you know how to reach each of your employees? You would say, sure, Jim, we've got uh, their cell numbers, we've got their work numbers, that we may have their home uh, email. We can get a message to all of our employees. Do you not know how to reach your customers? Absolutely. We know who our customers are. We know how to reach out to them directly. And then finally, I would ask, do you know how to reach your vendors? Well, yeah, we know the people that we uh, spend money with. We know how to reach them. Your goal will always be able to be, as, to, be able to always communicate directly to your stakeholders and not through a third party. 
you're not going to be able to get out in front of it and frame it and cause it to eliminate. We want to give the right message to the right person at the right time in the right way. Let's talk about that a little more as we go along. So as we said up to this point, you spend a lot of time building the organization. Continuity of operations is absolutely critical. Resilience is a key element associated with what you're doing in each of these areas. But if you're going to have a significant success, and if you're concerned about those events, the reason that there are business continuity professionals, the reason why those elements are there is that things actually change and go wrong. One common rule to remember and start out with in every area is if you're explaining in a crisis, you're losing. Well, the reason why we didn't do anything is that. Well, we didn't, we, we tested that piece of equipment. Those are all going to make you lose. You're talking on the wrong subject to the wrong, to the wrong audience at that point. So the same level of detail that you have in designing your business continuity program, the same level of detail that you're, you design your standard operating procedures within your business of how you do what you do every day, that level of detail needs to go into the communications area because this is where it's going to make a difference in the outcome within your organization. So someone says you need to talk. You need to get out in front of it. You need to frame that issue. Maybe that person's a board member. Maybe it's a senior manager. Maybe it's the CEO. A, there's a rule of five that I would encourage you to take. And when someone says we need to talk, you should say, why? And then let them give you an answer. When they give you the answer, then you say, why? And then they'll give you another answer. Then you say, why again? If you can go through asking why five times, then you should communicate. There's no question. You've thought it through. You're well organized and put into place. However, I will tell you that somewhere around that, the reasoning of why we should communicate falls away, and there isn't a need to communicate at that moment in time. Now, we're going to talk about the types of communications that you can make in just a few minutes. But this element of slowing the process down, you actually have the luxury of time to frame your message because we want to, get again, get the right message to the right audience in the right way. So what we are focused on are those elements. There will be pressure in every situation about what should we do and what should we say. But asking this why will clarify that because that's where the impact of the crisis will come associated with your brand and your reputation. So the three C's of crisis communications are listed here. The one communication that you're going to make immediately at the very onset is the one that you're probably the most com comfortable with. And that communication said, what do you need people to do? If we're in a facility where um, it's more dangerous outside of our building than in, uh, there's a tornado watch, there's a bad storm, then we're going to shelter in place and we're we're going to remain in our facility and we're going to communicate that out to our employees or our students or our teachers or whatever our organization is. And then if suddenly there's a violent threat in our area, but the threat is outside our building, we're going to go on to lock out. Keeping that threat outside of the organization, we'll be aware, we're going to monitor reports that are coming in, we're going to continue to function. If the threat's inside our building, Let's assume then that there is an active shooter and they penetrated into our facility. That's where the lockdown command comes, securing yourself in a secure area in the building. And then the final is evacuate. If you can get out of the building, if the threat is, if it's safer outside of the building than inside, it's the opposite of the shelter in place. Or if you know that there's a violent threat in one part of the building and you're in a completely different area, and it's safe to get out, you will evacuate. So understanding those things, those are communications that we want to see coming out initially in those areas. Normally those communications tend to be more internally oriented, but they may affect a customer. It could affect um, a vendor. So you could communicate with that, that we are uh, going to be closing for a while and passing that information on. The crisis communications come later. This is the one that everybody wants you to talk about right now. 
in almost every crisis that we've responded to, that communication can wait until the second day. If you're making that communications initially, you're making it based upon wrong and incomplete information, and the chances are that you'll get the wrong message out. If you look again at the United Airlines discussion that we had, the CEO came out in that first 24 hours, oh, our people did the right thing, they did it the right way, they followed our protocols and procedures and everything is, is exactly as it should be. Clearly he had inaccurate information. Clearly there was not an understanding there. And ultimately that cost him the opportunity to become uh, the chairman of the board of that, of that airline. Those types of decisions, those types of communications very early on are going to create problems. So you want to wait until you know what's occurring and then look at what the impacts are, what are the audiences, and what are the messages that we're going to give to each of those. You've heard us talk about home bases and message maps. That's why it's so important that we lay out, here are the threats and risks that we are concerned about. Here are the stakeholders, and here are the questions under those, and here is the message that we would tell those stakeholders if that occurred. Uh, death of an employee, even those messages would vary depending upon the nature of it. Was this an accident? Was it uh, a violent act? Was it an illness? Each one of those carry different messaging that we could move forward with. The last is compliance. Generally, that's more uh, 30 days down the road. So the coordination is instant. The crisis is probably uh, a day or two after the event. The compliance, though, would be we become aware of cyber breach, since that was mentioned as the highest risk. Those communications would occur within a reasonable time. Most of the statutes uh, use language like that and the various definitions around cyber breach vary uh, from one state to another, even the definitions of personally identifiable information and whether we're talking about that or personal health information or protected health information or HIPAA, those types of compliance communications would come at a later date and you'd have to give them more specific instructions associated with it. If you don't have a separate crisis communications plans for cyber, you probably are missing something that would be very important because in today's world, that's a very high likelihood. And as you all identified in the survey, that's clearly one that we want to be prepared for. So these three communications will be the basis of what we talk about. And you'll see that here we're not talking about explaining or trying to make this go away. They're very targeted and they're very focused. So if you're thinking about a crisis uh, communications and there's a process that you go through, the first step is predict. Who is the audience? Who are you talking to? And what are their concerns? That's going to be the foundation as you try to create your plan and give your message. Are we talking to a customer? Are we talking to a client? Are we talking to an employee? Are we speaking with a regulator? Uh, are we speaking with a vendor? Those conversations would be completely different and the concerns of each of them would vary. So that will drive our communications. The plan that you would come up with then is to tailor the message, the messenger, and the media, or that we could use the word medium, that would occur and format it to each stakeholder. Because sending a message on Twitter is different than uh, sending out a press release, uh, sending, uh, making a phone call versus uh, writing a letter would be a different medium. Now, we will all remember a few years ago uh, where the plane crashed in Indis Indonesia. It was lost. The plane was never reco recovered. You may or may not remember how families were notified of the death of their loved one. They received a text message. A text message to tell me my loved one is dead? Think about the reaction to that medium changing the perception of the individual who's carrying it out. So tailoring the message, tailoring who is delivering the message, and tailoring the media or medium that you use is absolutely critical. And then formatting what that message is to the stakeholder. What are you telling them and what can you share? And recognize in a crisis, many things you cannot share and stay due to restrictions. And then so you focus on three key messages. The message map concept is that here's the question, here's the stakeholder, here's the impact, here's the first key message I want them to know. 
here's the second, and here's the third. Planning those out, aligned with all the vulnerabilities and threats and risks that you've identified up front, will make it easier for you to respond. If you're a bank and you have to close branches, okay, there's uh, been a weather event. What is it that we want our customers to know? Uh, are there some branches that were open? When do we expect to be uh, reopened? Think about the questions that people would ask in that environment. If we're selling a service and I was expecting someone to come, what messages would you uh, say associated with that? If there's been a cyber breach, what messages are you going to say? Is my identity at risk? What are you going to do to help me? Where do I go? How do I find out if I was included? So the messages change depending upon the threat and the vulnerability and what occurred and who you're speaking with. So if you take those three C's and you take this decision process, now you're in a beginning format to be able to establish um, where you're going to go. If we do the wrong thing or say the wrong thing, we certainly are off to a bad start. I think we've all become addicted to GPSs here uh, in driving. The thought of maps are gone. I had a conversation with someone at the conference yesterday about uh, how this, is, this world has completely changed. And sometimes the way we want to go is closed. And we have to find an alternative way to get there or a parallel way to try to get that information out. The same thing is true here. Because if suddenly you've had a loss of power in your area, you're not going to be able to send those messages the way that you had hoped. What is your backup plan, just as we would think about our actions? Now, if you're trying to figure out this crisis has occurred, the key element that ties all of this together is how bad is it? We find that people tend to want to communicate when they don't need to. We focus on three elements, and I think this is something that you can bring to your organization that would immediately help target your response. It's outrage, fault, and fear. In whatever's occurred, is there outrage? Is there fault? Is there fear? If we think about the water uh, pollution in Flint, Michigan, where the water was contaminated for a period of time, well known but yet it continued to allow to be incurred and people were being poisoned by that water or contaminated or put at health risk in that area. And the leadership knew that it was occurring. Different matter than, wait a minute, a tanker truck just overturned and there's an event that happened. So when you find yourself in, in a crisis, think about outrage and use Flint, Michigan as a, as a benchmark. Severe uh, would be the intensity of that crisis from an outrage standpoint. Was there fault? Yes. It appears that the water department and leadership knew that this was occurring, so there was clearly a severe level with fault. And was there fear? Yes, my child will become sick. They could develop cancer. Uh, there could be uh, problems with children being born. There could be a significant threat of health issues that after a period of time. So when you think about the crisis that you're in and everybody is forcing you to communicate, you want to slow it down and focus on is there outrage, is there fault, and is there fear. That will help you determine the urgency and direction that your communications must go. As we think about it, do you have a documented and trained management team with a tested crisis management plan? The great news is the survey showed that half of the organizations that we surveyed uh, have that in place. Strangely, a fourth don't. Some says, well, it's written and trained but not tested, and some it's written only. And the effectiveness deletes if you don't test your plan and exercise it. That's one of the five common failures that we find in disasters and crises, is the failure to have a crisis communications plan and the failure to train and test on that plan. Those are gaps, and then if you add it to the third, which is the failure to monitor for threats and risk, you start to see how those failures cascade the impacts in a disaster or crisis. Now, we use a maturity model to look at organizations to see how they're doing and how they manage crises and events. And in this maturity model, we look at the decision process, the roles and responsibilities, the information clarity, the speed of decision making, and the communications effectiveness. Now, we measure that across four different stages. 
uh, moving from a liability all the way to where it becomes part of the culture and it's strategic within the organization. Now within each one of the box there, you'll see descriptors so you can see where your organization is. If you look at decision process, you could, and you were at a surprise level, processes are developed as a reaction to the situation and lots of debate on process. Experts are called in late. This is the liability for it, and everything is coming as a surprise to that organization. Looking at roles and responsibilities, if you move to that second box over under the basic stage, it shows that roles and responsibilities are clear but defined as needed. Support resources are not defined. Most issues covered. That means some aren't. They don't have support identified. They're still in a reactive mode even if they have it. Look at information clarity. And let's go over to supported. Basic data for predefined, event-specific information quickly identified, fast organizational response for date and input. That's good. Actions have clearly taken, so looking at information clarity, that's where you would be. Speed of decision making, and we'll go all the way to strategic and look at that, that block. Highly efficient and timely decision process anticipates events and needs and consumes only resources as needed. Then it's strategic. It's part of the culture integrated within it. But if you look at these areas here, look at the ones that relate to communications, the communications effectiveness, the information clarity, and then you could tie to that the decision process and the timing and making those that would put it together. So clearly you can see from a crisis management perspective, over half of the impacts come from the communication side of the house. Now as we move from each one of these stages to the next, and looking at where your organization ranks, uh, those become breakthroughs. So if you can move from everything being a surprise to where you're moving into some basic things in place and you've got uh, reaction capabilities, that's a called a control breakthrough. You now are getting more controls in place and fundamentally your organization will be stronger. When you then can move to the point that it's supportive and you have the pre-actions in place, that's an alignment breakthrough. You're aligning your responses. You're aligning your resources. You're, you're aligned to be ready to operate. And then finally, if it is built in, it's strategic, it's a part of your culture, that's uh, a clear value breakthrough. I sat through uh, a crisis management exercise with an organization uh, in the last couple of weeks, and they started immediately trying to fix the problem and didn't follow through on the plans that they had in place. They were treating everything as, as a surprise instead of having it already integrated with steps and actions to take. You can certainly see a difference. I would encourage you every time you do, you do an exercise, every time you have a live event, pull out the maturity model and have the group talk about where they are. Now, one fundamental warning here. If you are high in two or three or four of them, it's not an average here. It's the the level of your weakest spot. Because the plan will fail. If you are one in a category, you now are at risk in response to that crisis. That's a very sobering message to deliver. So you have the right to remain silent. And by the way, just before the webinar um, this morning, uh, Bill Baker and Karen and I were talking about it. And, uh, we've seen on television 4,000 times or more uh, the police are reading the Miranda rights to criminals. You're in a, you committed a crime, they caught you red-handed, they're arresting you, and they're advising the criminal that they have the right to remain silent. If we're telling that to criminals in a crime that they seem to be caught red-handed, how much more important is it to your leadership to remain silent if they find themselves in a crisis? If they start talking and saying things that are wrong or saying things that are untrue or saying things that they should have known but didn't, now you're in a situation where your brand and reputation are impaired and the credibility will be lost and those events will go the wrong direction. So if you think again about some of the crises that you've seen, you have the right to remain silent is what we want you to do. If we can tell a common criminal this, then more importantly, you've got to have your leadership understand it. Will there be a time to talk? Yes. Will it be in the first few seconds? No. The initial communication, going back to those three C's of communications, is to do the coordination. Shelter in place, lockdown, lockout, evacuate. 
Beyond that, we're going to remain silent until we know what's occurring. Now, you don't get to quote Calvin Coolidge very often. Uh, in fact, it, uh, when you think about the history classes that we've had and uh, gone through, I don't remember much more about Calvin Coolidge, uh, except he was the, in the motion pictures of that day, and uh, all of them were in black and white clearly, and comments were, silence can never be misquoted. And that theme, coming back with the one that you've just seen, are messages that I need you to carry back because you can't misquote it. If you take a call from the press and you speak with them, and uh, it, so it Bill's on the call, and so I'll say, and so they talk to Bill on the phone, then they can say, hang up the call, go on the air and say, I spoke today with Bill Baker, and anything they say after that makes it appear as if Bill said it. If you don't speak, if you're not there, you can't be misquoted. So we would encourage you to make sure all your employees know that they're not an authorized spokesperson. They're not to speak to the media. If they are contacted, get the contact name and information, but never promise a call back. Firestorm will support you with our Crisis Stop program. Uh, we, if you are interested in that, drop us an email or respond. We'll register you. doesn't cost your company anything, by the way. Free is our best price. We rarely pay people to take our advice. And what you gain here is the ability to get uh, a senior crisis management uh, professional on the phone in your crisis in that first hour. We'll help you stabilize the situation, understand what's going on. We'll trigger the, uh, help you trigger the appropriate responses. Is that security? Is that um, uh, counselors that you need to have? Is it your insurance has been notified or uh, legal uh, has to be consulted? opine on what the short-term, mid-term, and long-term consequences are, and prevent you from making the common mistakes, like talking to the media. Because the decisions that you make, the actions that you take, and the words that you say in the first hour will determine, does this crisis stabilize, or does it continue to escalate? That becomes the most important critical element that you're going to see. That first hour of crisis management support is available to you at no cost. There is going to be a brief about uh, today's uh, webinar and session. Uh, it's, you're saying the wrong thing, and it will be up on our website probably next week, and you can download. We've also will record, have recorded the session today, so that if you'd like to attend it or share the information with someone in your organization, you'll be able to do so. So you go to firestorm.com, click on briefs, and then you're able to download it directly there. Hit the right button and we went the right direction. If you go the wrong direction in a crisis, you're going to have the wrong outcome. Say the wrong thing, you're going to have the wrong outcome. Our thanks today to the Association of Contingency Professionals and in particular the Eastern Great Lakes chapter and the chamber there. It's important that this information be shared and understood. Form.com for uh, information and access to the briefs, to watch past webinars, and to register to future webinars. We, there's an Irish blessing and curse that I quote many times, and it's, may you live in interesting times. And that's the time that we find ourselves in. When you were asked, are there particular risks that you're concerned about, you identified the list. We know that there are exposures. We know there are risks. You as a professional would not be on this webinar today or doing the work in your organization had you not done that. The key element here, though, is in addition to your plan and training your people and running exercises is to be prepared from a communication standpoint. If you haven't taken the same level of detail to create the home bases, the message maps, create the open intelligence network that identifies where you are, are you at a guarded level, an elevated, an imminent, or severe, you're placing your organization at risk. We will be able to help and look forward to talk more with you about that. So you can go to firestorm.com. If you've got a question, send us a webinar, uh, an email at webinars at firestorm.com, or pick up the phone and call us at 800-321-2219. Thank you for your time today, and until we speak next month, uh, I hope the uh, summer is good and the weather is perfect for you where you are. Thanks, everyone. Goodbye.